Hey, this is Raul for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we are out on location getting information for you, our bass readers, worldwide, and we are in sunny Arizona, and we are at the Roberto Venn School of Lutheran, and I'm here with Bart. Yes. Yes. And Bart is an instructor here. Uh, I'm the assistant director. The assistant I get, director. I do all the fun stuff, the office work. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, uh, of course, we're thrilled because the instrument is what gives us musicians our voice. So what better place to come than where they make instruments like this, and, and particularly basses. So tell me a little bit about the history of the school. Where, where did this all kind of come from? Well, the school basically kind of started out as a, uh, uh, a journey, really. The uh, original founder of the school, his name was John Roberts. He was a lumber pilot down in Nicaragua. And he would fly the plane over and, and survey the trees and, and report back to the lumber company. And they would go in and clear cut the trees and they just wanted the straight green stuff. So they'd cut up and leave the roots that would snake out into the jungle. So he found some locals, uh, some natives down there in, in South America and had them cut these roots out and he was gonna build a yacht. And uh, so he was quite a dreamer, um, had some wild ideas. And then through you know a few different events that happened with the plane he was flying was a little out of repair and his wife had some eyesight issues. They brought all this wood back to the States. Turns out it was three boxcar loads of rosewood, mahogany, and some other, some other varieties. Wow. And he brought it back to Phoenix and met some guitar makers. And the guitar makers said, hey, this is guitar making wood. They showed him how to make guitars. So he opened his door to, as a, it's called Juan Roberto Guitar Works and they started teaching people to make guitars. Um, he had quite a sense of humor. He, uh, he was making Spanish style guitars and figured he didn't have any street credibility being a white guy making Spanish guitars. So he said, okay, my name is Juan Roberto. So that's where the Roberto came from. And then Bob Venn was a gentleman from Bakersfield area, done, did some work with uh, Semi Mosley of Mosrite Guitars and Leo Fender. And those two joined forces and it became kind of what the program is today, an acoustic and an electric guitar. And then the current director, uh, while finishing his master's degree at Stanford, he kind of wrote the business plan to make it what it is, licensed, accredited, actual trade school. Nice. So that's kind of the, it's kind of the long, short history. Mm -hmm. And uh, so started as a licensed school in 1975 and 41, 42 years later, well, here we are. Wow. So. Wow. And tell me, how many, how many students do, do you guys have at a time? Um, we have a capacity for 40, and we're usually anywhere between 35 and 40, so our classes are typically nice. filled up. Um, we do two a year. They're five months long, 10 hours a day, five days a week. Super intensive, uh, very hands-on. Uh, there are lectures involved. There's hands-on demonstrations, but the majority of the time is actually hands-on doing the process. Our theory is you can't build a guitar until, until you build a guitar. You kind of have to do it for the light bulb to go off. Uh, so we've uh, you know had a lot of students come here and go on and do amazing things some of the greatest luthiers out there have been through the school wild so. and with with the curriculum what, do people build a little bit of everything what what would be a traditional how would how does that work what's the, the students are required to build one acoustic and one electric guitar or bass mm -hmm. so for all the bass players out there this is a good place to learn how to build basses as well I'm a bass player and started wanting to make my own basses and mm -hmm. Here I am. So they make one uh, six string flat top still string acoustic guitar, uh, kind of limited on the, on the design just because there's so much going into an acoustic. They're making all the braces, the carve in the neck, the hill, everything's done by hand. Um, the electrics, we let the students do a six or seven string guitar or a four or five string bass. A couple of neck joints to choose from. You can choose their own hardware, pickups, tuners. Uh, uh, so a lot of variety in the electric guitars. Fascinating. So they can do a little bit of design work. So Fascinating. And one of the things that's really, I always find interesting is that at a place where people are learning, you find that a lot of ideas can happen that maybe somebody didn't have before. And just looking at the walls behind us, a lot of these instruments are just gorgeous. Uh, tell us a little bit about like in the design process. I mean, if you see, do you run into people that, are, that you go, wow, this guy, just showed up with a really great idea. Well, you, yeah, it's amazing. You know, it's the first time, you know, we always try to remind our students, this is your first guitar. You don't expect it to be perfect, but mm -hmm. it's pretty surprising how many really great designs I've seen happen on a first time basis. Like a student that doesn't have a lot of experience, just has a knack for it. And I've seen some great designs. 
We've had students come up with great ideas on how to approach different repair techniques and things. So there is a real synergy that happens in the student environment. Gotcha. There's a real peer-to-peer -peer learning. The students are helping each other. Um, they're feeding off each other. So and they feed off of our staff, and our staff feeds off the students too. So it's a real um, synergistic uh, relationship for sure. Gotcha. And I know also in the learning process, uh, a lot of learning happens actually when you mess up, because that's where you find okay, how do I <laughs> Wow. How do I fix this? I, mean, or, I know how, that too well. But, but. <laughs> and, and there's a this is a, a safe place to be able to do it because yes. and this is where, if anything, you want to encounter all of the hardest yes, things absolutely. because you've got a wealth of people around you that can go, okay, I, I see what's happening here. Right. Or, you know, it, it, it reminds me, this is away from bases for just a brief moment. When I was a kid growing up, I got a spoke to uh, tightener for my bike and I thought oh some of these spokes seem really loose so I decided to tighten all the spokes all at once and I ended up with this spaghetti weavy kind of thing and I was only happy that I wasn't employed by some bike shop because I just ruined my wheels right right and I tried to tighten them all up hey I didn't know what those spokes well I didn't know what they would do if you tightened them and now yeah. I do so yeah. thanks to your experience I just learned something so there you go well what you're saying rings so true um, for our students especially because uh, you know, when they make mistakes, a lot of times you'll see they're a little distraught and frazzled. And a student who doesn't have any mistakes is going to get the least out of it. The exactly. students who have the most mistakes, granted it's frustrating and it can set you back, but you're going to learn how to undo something. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, you know, I think we kind of had a saying here, like the best guitar makers, well, I think I've heard this on other, um, other uh, you know, w other kind of woodworking crafts and everything, is that the best woodworkers, guitar makers are the best at covering mistakes. Cause doesn't matter how good you are, think something's going to go wrong. Absolutely. Um, I've definitely had opportunity to do inlay where I didn't think I was going to do it. So, um, so sometimes you might see a really amazing piece of marquetry or inlay on an instrument. Mm -hmm. There's a very good chance that it might be fixing something that didn't go as planned. So. Well, and when you're working with a substance that has a certain randomness to it, as wood does, you could maybe have a knot somewhere where you didn't particularly yeah, carve, want Carving a neck, or... I've had things show up that, oh, there, I didn't know that was there, and then luckily it went away, but if it doesn't, you have to know how to address it or what, what you do with that. Exactly, so, see, right. I, and, and I have, I, and I haven't, I don't know that I've shown it on camera, I have a, a Puerto Rican Cuatro, which was a solid body chiseled out of a block of wood, but the guy, this piece of wood he used, was, used to be a piece of pier, and there was a bolt through it, and basically the way he cut it out, he made a cutaway, so you've got better reach for the fretboard, but that was how he fixed the hole where the bolt was. By doing a cutaway? <laughs> By doing a cutaway. <laughs> right. It's an opportunity for expression or something yeah. that wasn't going to be there. And so. when everybody would see the instrument, they're going, what's wrong with it? What's it? Why is it missing that piece? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's on purpose. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and then afterwards, I started seeing cutaways. Right. Where, where people are going, hey, that's, that's not a bad idea. Maybe that's I'll do funny. it that way, too. So with, with the projects the students do, I, I guess I have a couple of questions. Where do they go from here, do many of them do, do like your alumni? Are many of them doing custom work? They're on their they're own? all over the place. I think most of our students dream when they come to a school, or any student that would pursue a school like this. I think everyone's long term goal would be eventually be your own boss, have your own business, go sure. on and, and do your own thing. Um, the reality is, when you leave here, you're going to want to go and ideally work for somebody else for a while, learn the trade, learn the craft, put in some time, pay your dues. Um, we have a lot of graduates who have gone on to do amazing things. Um, a lot of great base builders out there too. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Adamovic bases. Yes. Uh, he's one of our grads, oh, and nice. uh, yeah, I've, just, I've been following his stuff on Instagram. He makes such a beautiful base. Um, that's just one example, but we have a lot of guitar makers who are in the upper echelon. Um, one of our grads from the mid 2000s was uh, he worked with us for a couple years, and then he went and apprenticed with Urban Samoji. Um, and then he went out on his own, and he was at the NAMM show this last year, and one of the guitars he had was $20,000, and it was already, wow. already bought. So it's like some pe people are getting into that level. We have grads who have gone on to open repair shops. Um, as I said before, uh, Joe Valley, one of our instructors, is also the guitar tech for the Doobie Brothers. So we've had grads who have gone on into that field. In fact, he'll lecture to the students about uh, road teching and what it kind of takes to do that job. And, it's, you know, it's kind of a tougher thing to get into. You have to sure. be at the right place at the right time. But one of our more recent grads, grads ended up out with Miley Cyrus, and now he's out with um, nice. somebody else. And so we've had grads who have gone into wood, you know, wood 
hunting and selling and providing wood for other builders. Mm-hmm. And so really, you know, the sky's the limit. So fascinating. And what kind of are people come from all over the country to be here to all to over the, the world? Class? Wow. So, um, we have in this class we have a student from South Korea. Um, next class, I know we've got a student coming from Japan and a student coming from the United Kingdom. Um, we have students from all over the place, really, mostly from all over the country. Not as many from Arizona. We usually get a couple, but mm-hmm. they're coming from all over the place. So they'll relocate here for six months and um, so and learn about guitar making. Very cool. Very cool. And of course, you're you're building stuff of your own. Yes. While while you're at it, you want to tell us a little bit about what what you do? Yeah. I'm well. I'm a bass player and. Actually, I started for me being in high school and playing in my first band, and I started trying to draw a logo, and somehow the idea came to my mind, oh, I'll make all the instruments. Mm-hmm. I was a little ambitious thinking I'd make them all, but, but the idea of making basses just stuck with me, and then I f- saw an article about the school in the newspaper. This is back in 93, and I said, oh, that's what I'm doing for sure. So I came down, checked out the school, signed up for the next class, and um, so I, I do make basses. Um, had to have my own designs, and... Most of them have been ones that I play, and I've just recently started making them for some customers, doing some, uh, getting some commissions. Nice. Um, but yeah, I like to do things that are unconventional and different, and I think that you learn the most when you kind of go out on a limb and do something that you have to really think about what's happening. You know, like we have a, our textbook, and I could follow along with that, but if I deviate from that and do something like a head, I, I do headless stuff. and. Mm-hmm. There was, there's not really, we don't, we don't have a handout for a headless bass, so I had to kind of figure it out on my own and uh, learned a lot doing that, so. Got you. And one of the instruments I saw that you built, and I believe it's a, around this somewhere, has, has something that makes our readers howl when they see it, and that is more than four strings. Yes, so, yes, so this, this, was, this was thing. featured on some other social media site, and they basically said, what do you think of this? And it was kind of funny because I saw all kinds of, like, that's cool, that'd be fun. And then I also said, that thing would be great on a fire, you know. It's <laughs> like, I just have oh, to no. laugh because I know I'm doing something silly. And, but for me, it's just an experiment and it's fun and you're mm-hmm. learning something. And it's fun to play. It doesn't have to be, a f- when I play in my band, I play four string. That's it. Sure. I play, I don't, pref- I don't like five strings. I made some six strings. I don't, it's not my favorite thing to play. Mm-hmm. But it sure is fun to have some other composing tool and something that you can, you know, just experiment and express on. So. Absolutely. Well, and one of the things we've been doing, we've been talking to uh, a fair amount of bassists that are playing with Broadway shows. And the way it's written is for five strings. Right. So they have to have that well, low they B. Need they, that they, extra they, note, right? they, they cannot be going in with just four. That's funny. You know, so it's know kind that. of a requirement for them. Um, unless, you know, again, the nature of the music, uh, maybe a little more old school you go straight you know kind of fender four string kind of thing right and and you're good to go and what we're seeing also with playing and a lot of a solo bassist uh, venturing out into the extended range and you know that requires a whole other thought process in building because when you're doing a wider neck you know you've got like 11 strings uh, some of the things I've heard about is double truss rotting double and truss rod <laughs> well, carbon fiber I mean you got to think about there's a whole other litany of problems mm-hmm. another you're opening a can of worms for sure but I've seen some stu- oh, we had a student if few was quite a few years ago make a nine string that was the first time I saw one that big wow. where it looks like a aircraft carrier landing strip the finger bar does but that's you have to it's a whole other playing technique too and you have, sure. to, you have to address the instrument differently you know and, from and, building to playing the whole thing and so. even hand size right it comes in as one of the important things one of the musicians with one of the tours uh, he's, he's he's you know Man, his name is Casey. I'm getting terrible with age, but he plays a four-string Jackson, and I'm kind of going, dude, you could have whatever bass you want. What are you playing right. a four-string Jackson? And he says, well, what I do is I tune it like like a five-string. So I've got the low B. Right. So I'm tuning low, but the neck is narrow. It's comfortable with my hands. Right. And I'm like, okay, there's a very practical right. approach to this, right. you know, and you're making it do what you want to do. Right. So right. That, that's, that's really cool. And I noticed with one of the instruments that you were showing me that also you do some experimenting with different materials. So there's some acrylic built into yes. one of your bases. That's probably more along the line of what more advanced stuff that you do, right? Yeah, that it is. And that was an experiment also. It was... Sometimes I just have these moments where I go, oh, that'd be cool, and I mm-hmm. do it, and I'm like, okay, I won't do that again, but <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I did it. You know, that one, I was making this frame design, and the thought was, will the frame be stable? Will, you know, will it stay, hold its shape? 
So I thought I'll put some stable core in there. And then I said, oh, I'll put lights in it. So it became this whole thing. Yeah. And uh, so that, that was a real tri uh, trial and error thing. I had to restart the wings several times because the glue wasn't holding. I had to go find some special like fish tank glue to hold it together. And uh, but yeah, I mean, there's you know, you can experiment with all kinds of materials and techniques. And uh, I mean, I, if, obviously, when you're looking at bases, there's some really wild stuff out there. But absolutely sometimes simple is better but i can't help myself but to do something different just for the sake of trying to learn something new you know gotcha and if if you were to like encounter and i know there's going to be people that see this and they they start maybe even asking themselves is that something that i would like to do or i might find myself doing what what would you tell somebody a prospective student you know that what what do you need to 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 be able to do this well as a prospective student or someone who's new to this, it's like don't try to make your dream guitar the first time you make a guitar. Simpler is better. You're learning fundamentals. You know, mm -hmm. you're learning basic hand skills. Some we have students who come in here who have already made guitars. Some of them have already sold guitars that they've made. Some people have spent a lifetime in a trade where they use their hands. And then we get students who have zero working experience at all. So even at that point, you know, you're trying to learn the basics. Um, if you have experience, obviously you're trying to perfect your craft, but mm -hmm. um, it's really about patience and, uh, you know, just trying to to learn the fundamentals, really. Gotcha. And it always does come up, and I, and I don't know if it's part of the curriculum, do you teach any of the business we, stuff? We do, actually. Uh, William Eaton, the director, does, a, we do starting your own business lecture. Nice. We actually make our students do resumes and cover letters, because mm -hmm. our primary, primary objective is occupational training. So being an accredited school, um, it's one of our measures of success is do we get our uh, students jobs in the field and we nice. work really hard at that but yeah we, we do talk about starting your own business and what it takes to you know marketing is the number one thing as we were talking mm -hmm. about it's like you can build the most amazing instrument in the world but if you can't market it you're gonna just sure. you're not gonna sell anything so well only in the field of dreams can you build it and they will come exactly yeah. marketing <laughs> makes the world go around apparently so <laughs> absolutely well let's take a look at the facility we're going to walk you guys through I expect you're going to see a little bit of bumpy footage as where this is a live tour of the Roberto School of Luthery in but you have to see what we're seeing so we'll go on that on that round right now sounds good perfect okay so this is our uh, gallery here um, we've been at this location for about five years now and uh, school has been a licensed accredited school for the past 42 years, coming up on 42 years. Uh, so we have a gallery here and this is what we really like about this new facility is that when we graduate our students we'll actually do an exhibit and invite the public, friends and family can come and see all the students work. So we'll take all the instruments out here, fill it up with all the student work and uh, it's a really great little event we can do. Um, if you come out this way, we'll, we'll see the shop, the workshop. So this is our main workshop here. Um, student benches all around the perimeter. We also have instructor benches kind of sprinkled in the middle there. Uh, so basically our students are here 10 hours a day, five days a week for five months. So it's a pretty intensive full-time guitar making immersion. So they're, they build one acoustic and one electric guitar while they're here and they learn a lot of different repair operations as well. Um, over here is one of our demo lecture areas. We'll do you know shorter lectures, some demonstrations here at the bleachers. Um, and anything that makes a lot of noise and sawdust we do outside. So we can take a walk out there and you can look around the shop here. Students are working on their, about halfway through the class, working on their instruments. Watch your step here. This is the student machine area here. Uh, anything that makes a lot of noise or sawdust will keep outdoors. Um, you know, the, every location the school's been out has had a great outdoor milling area. So this is what kind of really sealed the deal with this location for us is that we can do outdoor work. When the weather's nice, students will work outside just because we can. Um, so as you can see, they're doing some neck carving uh, on their acoustics today. Um, and 
getting ready to get their electric guitars in this finished booth and their acoustics will be shortly behind. So we can come on down this way. And this is our uh, milling area over here. Um, our students don't do a lot of milling. Um, we'll teach about it, but we're not going to give them a 10-foot board like you see over there and, and tell them to go to town on that. We'll actually mill it up into something they can manage at their at the benches. And over here is our spray booth. Uh, both guitars get a lacquer finish, so they'll actually learn how to do spray finishing um, and buffing and all of that. So then we can walk in through here. Um, also kind of doubles as our student lounge, so can, students bring a lunch a lot and they'll eat lunch in here. But we'll do longer, more involved lectures in here um, and, you know, it's a little better climate control. And so this is uh, what we use this space for. And then we have our student library resource room. Uh, lots of different books and publications, student computer. It's kind of also our electric guitar testing room. Looks a little lived in today, so. But in we as in recent uh, classes, actually the last class we started videotaping all of our demonstrations, so they're available to our students while they're here. That way, if they miss something or if they don't get to the task until a day or two after the demo is given, they get a they can refer to it and they can also watch the demos ahead of time. So it's uh, a nice something that we've added recently. So now we can go back this way. Here, I'll show you the, our humidity control room. It's obviously very dry here in Arizona, so we try to keep the wood humidified. Uh, so basically, students get these cubbies, and this is where they store the wood when they're not actually working on it. Uh, that way, we keep everything humidified. As well as we use these decks here for gluing the braces and acoustic guitar tops and backs. But most of that has already happened for this class, so there's not a lot to see there. But so it's kind of student wood storage there. And then this actually just goes back to our gallery. And I can show you the, uh, I'll show you the office here. And this is, uh, this is my office and William Eaton's office. And um, obviously you can see I'm a bass guy myself and not a big fan of frets. Um, although I will put them in if they're requested by the customer, but uh, so these desks here are, are uh, some wood that came up from Nicaragua in the 60s, kind of part of the history of the school. Uh, and we turned them into desks, so. Well, hey, Bart, this is tremendous. The, this is an amazing facility and it makes me want to do woodwork. I don't know, it's just being around that. Well, let's it's, sign you up. We got room <laughs> in the next class. There you go. Since we're talking about signing up, how does somebody go about, what's the best way if, if somebody wants to sign up to come to the Roberto Van School of Luthery. Yeah, well, you know, our website is going to pretty much have all the details that someone would need to know to get themselves here. Um, you can apply online. We have two classes a year, as I was saying. Mm -hmm. They're five months long. Um, it is a 10-hour day, five days a week, super intensive, real immersion into guitar making. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if someone was interested, they can get to our website, which is roberto-van.com. You can find our application, all kinds of details. We actually have pictures. I personally take a picture of every student guitar, and we have them back to 2001 or 2000, I think. Every student wow. guitar that was made here is on our site, so it's a really cool gallery we have. And uh, We actually have a lot of uh, auxiliary avocational courses that we've started. We have pickup winding, some finishing classes. Um, we just did an inlay class with Larry Robinson. Um, case building, so we're trying to add more of these like evening and weekend courses for people who aren't going to be able to take off five months, but want to learn sure. some other little detailed things. So. Sure. That's outstanding. And if somebody wants to get a hold of one of your instruments, where's the best place for them to look for that? Well, they can look on, uh, I have a website, which is bartonbases.com. Mm -hmm. And of course I'm on, you know, social media and you can find me through the school's website as well. Excellent. And do you build like by specs? If somebody has something that they're thinking they want to do, is that some, something you do? Or? <sighs> So I build to spec within my own world, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't think I would want to do a, a copy of an instrument per se. Okay. Um, 
there's enough of those out there. Gotcha. Not, not to knock any of them because there's some amazing ones out there, but um, some I have a design like the frame instrument I've been making. The, mm -hmm. the one that uh, that I have here um, is it's a little heavy because of the acrylic, but without the acrylic, they come in about right about five pounds or under six pounds, super nice. lightweight. And um, I've been kind of focusing on those because I've gotten a few commissions for them and people seem to really like them. So, and and most of them have been headless, but so some, I'm flexible and would do custom different things but excellent well I'm sure if people look at your website they're gonna see maybe something that that just makes you go hey that that I can see myself playing that and I think that's where a lot of musicians you know you got to see yourself going, exactly yeah exactly and that's, yourself as a builder it. you'd like you know ideally you'd want to have your a design that someone would say hey I, I like that design I want I want to buy some a base from you that you made because I like what you're doing as exactly opposed to just, you know exactly because and and again I know not every as, as a consumer not every consumers ideas are necessarily good ideas sometimes we need to be coaxed away from yes. <laughs> something we thought might everybody's be a great got, idea everyone's got a different idea like I said you know some people would love to sit and noodle with this and some people would like to throw it on their campfire yeah and I'm fine with either one if they pay for it so <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha well thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule we're thrilled that we finally got a chance to, to walk through here this is a great facility Roberto Venn School of Luthery look it up find out more if you want to build guitars basses you know all of this stuff this is a great place to come they've really figured this out and you know this may be you know the place for you to be for the next five months and so definitely check it out and if you're thinking of being a luthier you want to give us bassists a voice and this is why it's such an important thing it's why we had a year of the luthier uh, last year but we're never tired of talking to the luthiers and well, you're absolutely. being grateful for you guys building instruments for us well, because we're, we're having fun Absolutely. So. Well, you've seen it here. Bart coming to you, Bart Applewhite coming to you from Roberto Venn School of Luthery, Phoenix, Arizona, brought to you by Bass Musician Magazine.